Um, wow, there's a lot of people here. Uh, first, I just want to thank you guys for uh, having me come out here today and speak to you all. Uh, when I first heard about the opportunity to come talk to young adults, especially young impressionable adults, I leaped at it because, believe it or not, I was in your shoes less than 10 years ago, so I feel like I can hopefully relate to you and uh, probably dated myself there a little bit, but uh, I especially want to thank Terry for organizing everything and uh, getting me up here today. And uh, I want to start with the genesis of my story. I grew up going to church, but I was kind of that kid that had to be pulled by the coattail to go to church. I'd wake up in the morning on Sundays and my mother would yell my name. I wouldn't be dressed. I wouldn't be ready to go to church. I'd go to church unwillingly and I'd hear a little bit, but I really wouldn't listen to what the preacher was saying. I, sometimes I'd probably fall asleep through some of the sermons. And we, when we went to church, it wasn't a 45 minute deal. It was, a, it was like a three and a half hour ordeal. So it was, it was an event. So church was a long process and it, it was a long deal for me every single Sunday growing up. But I always had a natural inclination or a calling, call it my conscience or just something pulling in my heart knowing that I should be approaching this thing seriously, but I just, I just could never, just could never grasp it, and that continued throughout, uh, continued throughout high, junior high and high school, and even on to college. During college, I would go to Bible study by myself, and I'd go to, I'd go to, I'd go to chapel services, and I would go with my wife, my girlfriend, now wife, and we would go, and I'd try to get the word in, but. You know, real life would just take over in what I was trying to accomplish, and I just couldn't get over the hump. I just couldn't get over the hump. So it was a, it was a tough situation for me. I knew I was supposed to be doing something. I didn't know what. I wanted my spiritual growth to be something that was moving forward, but it would just, it would just stay stagnant and never really. I never really grew in my spiritual growth, and like I said, that continued throughout my whole, uh, my whole junior high years, my high school years, and even on to college. But fortunately for me, my mother, she would always send Bible scriptures and uh, prayers for me to read. And sometimes I would read them and sometimes I wouldn't. But it was something that my mom always pushed on me and something I never forgot. So growing up, I was, uh, I was always involved in sports. And I learned, I learned I was pretty good at football from a very early age. And uh, I excelled in athletics, especially in football. And by the time I got to junior high and high school, I knew I was one of the better players, and I thought about wanting to play professional football one day, but that was more so of a dream. Everyone wants to play professional sports and get paid for it, but you know, you just, it's just almost wishful thinking in a sense. But from the age of 10, that was my dream or my goal to play in the National Football League. By the time I got to high school, I was an all-state, I was an all-state player, and everything was going and was coming into fruition. I'm like, okay. I'm gonna go play for the Nebraska Cornhuskers. I'll probably get drafted in the second or third round, and I'll go from there. That was my plan. Well, unfortunately for me, Nebraska didn't come calling. The stepbrother came calling, which the UNO Mavericks, Division II school. So I ended up signing to play for the UNO Mavericks. Disappointed, but still knew I had the ability to play football and I had the opportunity to make it to the NFL. So throughout my college years, it was the same thing as far as my spiritual growth. I'd go to church, I'd come home, I'd retain a little bit, I'd forget about it, and I'd go on to football. And it was the same process throughout those four years. And I just remember, I actually remember these selfish prayers I would do. I would actually try to act right, meaning one week I knew I had a big game against the Carney Lopers. So what I would do was I would, I would sit down in the beginning of the week, and I begged God to have me have a great game because all the NFL scouts were going to be there. And I promised him I was going to act right during the week. So what I would do is I'd stop going out. I'd stop watching some of those TV shows. I'd, I'd stop using foul language. I would do everything right. I would try to act right. I would, I would pray. I'd pray for an hour a day. And that fold on throughout the whole week thinking he was going to bless me with a great game and I was going to get drafted. And, and everything was going to work out well. So, so that was my mindset, almost using God to get what I wanted to get. So my senior year came around. I was an All-American at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And life was good. Scouts were at my practices. And I was feeling good by myself. I didn't play at Nebraska, but I still had the opportunity. 
opportunity to play professional football. Well, the draft came, I watched 252 names get called, and my name didn't get called. So I'm sitting there in my room. I remember my phone, my phone ringing, and I told everyone not to call my phone because I was expecting it to be one of the NFL teams. Well, my mom was calling, my brother was calling, my uncle was calling. Every time my heart would race, and I'd just shake my head and press ignore because I was so disappointed. Well, I didn't get drafted, and I didn't even get picked up as a free agent. And I just sat there thinking, wow, man, what now? Well, the Canadian League came, came calling, and I never heard of Canada, just knew it was cold up there. So, <laughs> so I said, why not? I still get to play football. You guys are all in college. So whatever money they were going to pay me was going to be 10 times more than I was making in college. So I went to Canada, went up north. Freezing cold. It's not cold in Nebraska. It's cold in Canada. It's, it's, you, you guys wouldn't believe it. So, went to Canada. My first year was good. I got to prove myself. Got to play a little bit, and I did really well, and well enough for the team to offer me another contract to come back the next year. So, I went. I got to Canada the next year, feeling good about myself, and according to my my plan, I was going to play well, get another contract, make good money, and move on from there. Unfortunately for me, an all-star player from another team became available, and my team picked him up, and guess what position he played? My position, linebacker. So I found myself in Canada with no friends or family, up north, really cold, three dirty roommates. They didn't cook, they didn't clean, so I was like, I was the mother. I was the mother cleaning, cooking, and taking care of all these guys, and um, and they didn't do much of anything. All they did was come home and mess the house up. So I was stuck with three roommates, and I got put on the practice roster. There's a lot of athletes here, but for those who don't know, the practice roster is basically, a, you're kind of like a punching bag. You practice, but you don't play, and you just, and you don't travel, and you get paid, your, your contract gets cut severely in half, even more than that. So I really wasn't making anything financially and I contemplated going back to Omaha, Nebraska and giving up this dream of football and just packing it up and going into the real world and getting acclimated to that. And it, it, was, a, it was a real down time for me. I, there was no friends and family around and I was with the roommates like I just told you guys and it, just, it was a tough, tough situation for me. But the one that did stay consistent was me going to chapel services. Our team chap, we had a team chaplain for the Edmonton Eskimos, and every t Tuesday I would go in, I would go in the team to the team chaplain, and I would hear a sermon, and he would preach, and like my years of growing up, I would retain some of it, but it wouldn't be much. So, you know, I'd, I'd probably retain a little bit, and then I'd go on and forget about it within a week. But but this week was different. He spoke about having faith as small as a mustard seed. I thought mustard seed. I, I didn't even know what mustard seed was. So. I got home, I jumped on Google and said that mustard seed at the time was the smallest seed in the world, no one seed in the world. And I thought to myself, man, that's, that's, that's pretty small. So take the small the mustard seed. So I took his advice. What else did I have to lose, right? So every day I started praying five minutes a day, five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the afternoon, five minutes at night. And then I started reading my playbook. I stopped going out, I stopped doing some of those other things, and I just really kept to myself. And I remember my roommates coming home from a late night, and they'd be looking at me, and I'd be reading my playbook, and I know what they were thinking, because they weren't on the practice roster. You know, they were big time, they were on the active roster, they were better players than me, so I remember what they, I could just see it in their eyes, and they were thinking, why is this guy studying this playbook? He's not, he doesn't play, why is he putting so much time into it? Well, all I was doing was reading my Bible, and studying my playbook. Faith is small as mustard seed, right? That's not that much. That's all it took. So within two weeks, that player that took my position, he blew out his hamstring, and all of a sudden I was thrusted into the starting line. I'm sure the coaches weren't too happy about that, but that was just the situation. They were kind of stuck with me. They didn't have time to bring in someone else to need the playbook. So that, that game that I played in, that first game that I played in, I was a CFL player of the week, and that turned into the CFL player of the month. And the following month, I was a CFL player of the month. And all of a sudden, we were one game away from the Great Cup, which is the equivalent to the Super Bowl here in the United States. And I just couldn't believe that. And I thought, wow, how, how did my life change so fast? Well, 
The season was over, I booked my ticket back to Omaha, and I remember telling my brother, man, I think they're gonna offer me a, a multi-year contract with a lot of money by Canadian standards, and he was, he was happy for me, he was proud, we're pumping our fists. I jumped on the plane, jumped on the plane, put my, my phone on airplane mode, and five hours later, I was back in Omaha. Turned on my phone, and I had 15 missed calls, and one of them was from my agent. I called my agent and he didn't even let me talk. The first thing he said was, I don't know what you did, but you have 15 NFL teams trying to bring you in. And my heart just dropped like, what? 15 NFL teams? Here, one minute I'm talking about going back up north to the freezing cold, hoping they give me a contract, and now I have 15 NFL teams wanting to sign me. So within a week, I was in Minnesota, and I was signing a million dollar contract with the Minnesota Vikings. And I just stood there in my hotel room after I signed that contract and I just shook my head. Wow, this is, this is great. The rest of my career went well. I played for the Minnesota Vikings. I played with Brett Favre, one of my childhood heroes. Some of the guys that I looked up to, I actually got to play with, like Peyton Manning. And it was just, it was surreal. And I got full of myself a little bit. I, I ended up playing for the Carolina Panthers. I got to my second contract. I had everything I'd ever wanted. I was 29 years old. I was retired, never had to work a day in my life. I had my dream car, my dream wife, my dream house. I had everything, but I still wanted more. I wanted another house. I wanted some more things. And it just wasn't enough for me. It just wasn't enough for me. And I started thinking, wow. Man, and I tell you what, I was getting a heck of a workout because I was doing this. My biceps were growing so big because I was doing all this patting myself on the back because it was all me. <laughs> I worked harder than everybody. I lifted more weights. I ran faster than everybody. I, 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 I did all this work, and that's why I'm in the situation that I'm in. So I was in the I was playing for the Carolina Panthers, my second team in the NFL. And after practice, I had a couple of voicemails. I picked up my phone, listened to a voicemail. And my mother just suddenly passed away. My mom was a healthy person. She always worked out. She always stayed fit, and she tragically just passed away. So that was a reality check. My heart dropped, and I, on my off days, I would fly from Charlotte to San Diego to console my dad, who just lost his wife of 38 years and my mother of 29 years. And that was tough for me. Football was going well, but my personal life wasn't. My mom was our spiritual backbone. She's the one that kept sending prayers and telling us to read it, even, even if we didn't understand what was going on. And then something else happened. I, uh, during practice, a random practice, I stuck my arm out playing football, covering a guy, and I tore my tricep, and it ruptured, and it rolled all the way back. And it was just a, it was a, it was a crazy random injury. And I was always one of those guys that was a, kind of the Iron Man. I've never, in the 27 years I've been playing football since I was 10, I've never missed a game, I've never missed a practice, I've never even missed a snap. So I've never had surgery, I've never been hurt. And all of a sudden, my mother passed away, and my career was potentially over, but my season was done. So now what do I have? I have time. My excuses before for not going to chapel or not reading my Bible or not reading my prayers was I was too tired. I didn't have enough time. I didn't have enough time. I have a game. I have to study my playbook first. I didn't have time. Well, after my surgery and 20 staples, what do I have? I have time, four hours of rehab a day, and the rest of the day to just sit there and either watch TV or do something about it. So I started reminiscing back on how I got where I was, and I remember thinking, man, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an idiot. I'm thinking it was me that did all this stuff. I'm thinking it was my hard work that put me in the situation I was. Not knowing it was God's favor that put me in the situation I was. You don't make it from Division II University of Nebraska, Omaha, the school they used to call the University of No Opportunity, all the way to the National Football League. I mean, and then I started thinking, there's 2,600 players in the NFL. That's 2,600 players out of how many billions of people in this world that get to play that sport. And I'm thinking, and I just thought it was me doing it. Like, it was my hard work. No, it was, it was I showed God a little bit. I just. Faith as small as a mustard seed. I read my Bible for five minutes, for 15 minutes total a day, and I, and I proved to him that I wanted him in my life, and he changed my life like that. To whom, who's able to do a measurable more than we can ever ask for. And that's what he did. He, he, I gave him a little, and he gave me a lot. He showed me everything. And I just started thinking, I just put myself 
I just, I started obsessing over God. I started reading my Bible every day. I, I started taking Bible courses. I uh, started going to Bible studies, talking to people. Just, I got obsessed with it because it was the truth. And that's what I want to tell you guys here today. That don't, I'm, I'm just like you guys. I made many of mistakes. I was in college less than 10 years ago, just like you guys here. And it is, it is a real thing. It is a real thing if you just pick it, pick it up and give it a chance. All you need is a little bit just to start. But, you know, football failed me. Your finances might fail you. Your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your parents might fail you. But God won't fail you. And you have to understand that. And that's the truth because he's perfect and we're all imperfect. So just take this opportunity to to start building a relationship with God. Don't try to act right like me by not cursing for one week. No, it's a natural process that evolves and you want more and more and before you know it, it overtakes your life. My, my problem was I had many priorities. You know, I gotta make more money, I have to work out, I, I have to gain weight, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to have a big wedding, I have to do all these things, but I learned that all I have to have is one priority, not priorities, which is God, and everything else will take care of itself. One priority, which is God, and just all you need is a little bit to start out with, and everything else will take care of itself. And I'm, I'm, I'm 32 years old now, and I recently, last year, had the opportunity, a few teams called, and they wanted to bring me in, but I turned them down. And before, three years ago, there's no way I would have turned down an opportunity to play football. Because what I thought about football 24-7, and whatever you think about most throughout your day, whether it's your money, it's your girlfriend, it's whatever, that's what you worship, that's your God, and football was my God. And that time last year when they called me, I wasn't ready, I couldn't handle both, so I finally chose my spiritual growth over football, and that's when I knew I took that major step. In the same way you young, you young men out there are trying to court some of the females that you like and you might want to potentially marry one day, the same way my wife, then girlfriend, I built a relationship with her by calling her, texting her, taking her out to dinner, taking her out to a movie, spending time with her, spending money on her. It's the same relationship I, I built with Christ by putting in time with him, putting in, effort, putting in that effort with him. So it's the same thing, guys. You have to build a relationship with him if you want to hear him talk to you. And, and that's what I did, and it is a real thing. I'm 32 years old. I'm, just, I'm really just a regular guy that was fortunate enough to get called by God to play in the National Football League, and that gave me a stepping stone to come talk to you guys. Never in my life did I think I'd be here in Bork, Nebraska three years ago. I remember driving past York, seeing the balloon, and went to go play the Cardinal Gophers every year for four years. That's all I know about York, and now I'm here talking to all you kids. So, so that's what I wanted, that, that's my story. It's, it's, I don't think I'm special, I just think I was given a platform, and I hope if you guys retain anything I said today, it's just having faith as small as a mustard seed and having one priority. Put God first and everything else will take care of, take care of itself. Thank you.